Like it or not, we are all inexorably tied to the climate in which we live, impacted by its cycle of constant change. Sometimes that change comes without warning, and a mild winter weekend becomes a prelude to destruction from above. Sunday, February 15th, 1959. In the port capital of St. John's, Newfoundland, residents are enjoying an unusually pleasant winter weekend. 16-year-old Ruth Wells has spent her last two days with schoolmate Shirley Noseworthy at her home in central St. John's. The weather was beautiful. It was a lovely weekend. Uh, calm and sunny and and my dad um, he drove myself and Ruth out to the bottom of Signal Hill and we went out to her house for supper. Ruth's father Clarence and her family live in an area of the city known as the Battery. Situated on the northern entrance of St. John's Harbor it is backed by the steep slope of Signal Hill. The Battery is a close-knit community, more like a large family than a village. Ruth's uncle, Alex Wells, and a cousin, Jack, live close by. Clarence and his wife, uh, they had a big family, boy. Well, we helped them to build a house up there, where we were still live on the Battery. And they were quite contented there, boy. They were happy, you know. Originally, mostly the community was, it was a summer uh, village, essentially. Uh, people fished out the community, dried the fish, and in the winter moved on to, on to other areas. As time went by, more and more people started to, uh, to live in the battery. Just up from Ruth's house is the home of her neighbors, James and Ethel Piercy, and their three children. My father was a fisherman. He fished during the summer months, and uh, in the wintertime he worked Long Shore as a stevedore. My mom loved it out here because she was from around the bay, as we called it. She was a very quiet person, really, but yet she just did so much in her own way. And my dad just adored her. The battery in itself was a community in itself, a fishing community, and everybody knew each other out here and everybody enjoyed each other out here. And we, it was a hard working community, but if you had anything, you would give it to your next door neighbor. And if they had it, you had it. We had no flowers or nothing. We used to have to shovel the road. Everybody shipped in. Neighbors in the battery have had a lot to shovel this winter, especially after a recent storm dumps 57 centimeters of snow on St. John's. Much of it still remains on the upper reaches of Signal Hill. The slopes at the base of the cliff are fairly steep. And most of the buildings and uh, facilities were built up on, uh, up on stilts. And the fact that the community was sitting on a southward slope really probably contributed to getting a lot more snow. The city of St. John's were, were quite aware of, of geological hazard in the, in the battery area. Uh, but they were, they were of, the, of the mind that it was mostly to do with the, with the rockfall potential. While rockfalls are common in the battery, they are considered more a nuisance than a danger. February 15th, 1959. Residents of the Battery are used to winter storms and are not surprised when winds begin to pick up. We were expecting a lot of snow, and again, being in 1959, there wasn't much on the TV about it. There was just a normal snowstorm, and we just took it for granted like any other snowstorm here in St. John's that we had. At the home of Clarence Wells, most of the family is staying in for the night, including Clarence's only son, Ted, who has just graduated from high school. But a little wind isn't about to prevent his sister Ruth and her friend Shirley Noseworthy from going out. We left after supper and went to St. John's Memorial Stadium to go ice skating. And ice skating started at 8 p.m and there was no sign of any storm coming up. 
might have been a little windy or something, but uh, it was really, really sudden, this storm, you know? All around 8.30, they made an announcement saying it was getting stormy out. They um, sent all the skaters home. Within the next hour, St. John's is paralyzed by a fierce winter snowstorm with gale force winds of over 200 kilometers an hour. Some skaters never make it home, choosing to stay at the stadium overnight. Shirley Noseworthy and Ruth Wells head for the safety of the battery. It was so, so stormy and blustery and, and the wind was high and my, it was just it was wicked out. She asked me to um, go out to her house for the night and stay out there. It was a, a northerly wind, and with the battery being oriented to the, towards the south, it meant that most of the snow was coming up over the hill, uh, falling onto the slopes just above the battery. Jack Wells and his wife have spent the evening with his mother-in-law. But as the storm worsens, Jack heads home to look after his own mother. When I come home, then I went in the house. Mother was there in it. I said, I got to bed all night out, I said. I think you should go to bed. I should be up at 3 and 4 o'clock in the morning, knitting in it. Jack Wells' neighbors, James and Ethel Piercy, have the same idea at their house. I think about 10.30, the lights went out. And of course, then well, Mom said, well, everybody just as well to go to bed. The house has three bedrooms on the second floor, one occupied by James and Ethel Piercy, one shared by the boys, Charlie and Carl, and a third shared by Gloria and her grandmother, Judith Vincent. My grandmother at the time was 74, and she was Mom's mother. By midnight, the city of St. John's is at a virtual standstill. On the eastern end of the battery, separated from the rest of the community, 34-year-old Harold Garland has just gone to bed. As soon as I got, when I got in bed, I was in the bed, I'd say about probably five, ten minutes when I heard this. I thought it was just thunder, we say, at first. I heard it. I seen it get louder and louder and louder. But when it's talking, I knew what it was. A snowslide has smashed into the back of Harold Garland's house, but has not covered it completely. There's no real peak to the roof. It's just a slanted roof, uh, well reinforced. Uh, so any snow slide that, that, that occurs from the hill above the house or behind the house just simply slides over the roof and collects in front of the door. Harold decides to take his family to the nearby home of his father one of the best protected houses in the battery. Just after one in the morning, Harold Garland and his family gather at the home of his father, Cyril. They are safe for the moment. At the home of Clarence Wells, Ruth Wells and Shirley Noseworthy are the only ones still up, but are about to turn in. And um, Ruth had put some covers over me and uh, she was picking up um, some sweaters, I believe, uh, off the chair as the noise came. It was like a um, 50 ton of dynamite. It was, loud. it was louder than thunder. Everything was so sudden. Like she was there in front of my eyes and then she was gone. February 16th, 1959. It is just after one in the morning, and the city of St. John's, Newfoundland, is paralyzed by a fierce winter storm. At the east end of the battery, the home of fisherman Cyril Garland is completely covered in snow, its occupants trapped inside. And when I got in the house, we said about five, ten minutes after that, down come another snow slide. Buried his in, we couldn't get out. I know then, it was something really 
really marked. So I'll, I'll come to my mind then how many people who are buried. We're not entirely sure what the, what the trigger may, may have been. So it could have been that the corn has developed, uh, achieved such a size that it just simply, could, simply couldn't maintain itself, uh, failed, fell onto the slope below, which had quite a lot of snow on it, and triggered the slide. And when this uh, mass of snow reaches the bottom and impacts something, uh, it's usually the snow that wins out. The slide cuts a swath down Signal Hill, 15 meters wide. Directly in its path are the homes of James Piercy and Clarence Wells. The avalanche smashes into the two houses, sweeping them downward into the rear of the houses below, one owned by Alex Wells, the other by his nephew, Jack. House on the back come down and struck ours and twisted all houses. No, I never knew nothing until the house on the back. I mean, nearly knocked me out of bed. The back end of Jack Wells' house caves in on the area where his mother sat knitting just hours before. The cable line from the brother's house come in, took the rocking chair and the stove and everything out in the front room. She'd have been killed. As luck should have it, she went to bed. The top story of the Piercy house is torn away by the roaring wind. It strikes the home of Alex Wells, ripping a hole in the bedroom wall. I don't remember hitting anything. I don't remember flying through the air. I just remember waking up. I was in a tunnel, and I could see light shining at the end of it. There was boards and snow and all kinds of stuff all around me. I crawled out of the tunnel. I had apparently been thrown something like almost 300 feet with the house. But I crawled out and I had no more than maybe a few bruises on my legs. I had been thrown a little further, I uh, almost ended up in the water. So that in itself, I always thought myself very, very lucky. Gloria Piercy's brother Carl has also been lucky saved by his bedroom's close proximity to the family bathroom. In the bathroom, there was this big shower. And as I recall, it was a big cast iron, heavy machine, heavy uh, shower as such. That's what prevented us from being carried away in the, in the snow slide. I looked for Charlie, I couldn't find him. I knew he was there. Like I remember, it was like a dream. I was embedded in the snow and all I could, I could hardly breathe. Uh, the snow was all around my body and that, and, uh, I still thought I was dreaming uh, until somebody hit me in the leg and I realized that I was completely covered with snow. I had, of course, just my pajamas and everything on and, and I heard people shouting and like that and they took me up to a neighbor's home and covered me up with blankets and everything for the night and said that everything was okay. It is only after the rescue of the three Piercy children that residents realize that the home of Clarence Wells and his family has also been demolished. The search for more survivors begins immediately. It wasn't uh, just a normal rescue when the, when the skies were clear and, and uh, you could see everything. This was in the middle of the night, in the middle of a, a raging blizzard. Nobody knew if another slide was coming. Nobody knew what was happening. But, um, everybody did what they could. Miraculously, Alex Wells hears cries for help, almost smothered by the din of the storm. He finds his brother Clarence trapped in a small opening under the remains of his house, his wife Beatrice and daughter Winnie beside him. They are hurt, but all are alive. Some distance down the slope of Signal Hill, another survivor lies buried in snow and debris, unnoticed by the rescuers above her. It is 16-year-old Shirley Noseworthy. One of the roofs off of the two houses that, that came down with the snow, one of the roofs was on, on top of me. I couldn't move, like, from the waist down. I was trapped. Uh, 
There was a lot of weight on me. I was pushing with my arms and, and pushing the snow away and, you know, trying to like, make an, an ear pocket so as I could breathe. It was just awful, very frightening. Despite the appalling conditions, rescuers are able to uncover more victims. Ruth Wells is found trapped under her parents' stove, her right leg severely burned. The discovery of the Wells family survivors encourages rescuers to focus their efforts on those still buried in the ruins of the Piercy home. But it is impossible to see anything in the steadily worsening snow. They have no choice but to wait until morning. The storm got so bad that they couldn't do anything. I mean, they tried to find my mom, dad, and grandmother, I guess, but like I said, the circumstances, it could have been another snow avalanche. Everything uh, quieted down after a while. It was so quiet, it was, it was still, and I was trying to hang onto my head and not, not go crazy, like, you know? Unaware that Shirley Noseworthy lies helpless so close by, rescuers and survivors gather in safer houses to wait out the storm together. It was, I don't know, it was a crowd of people, and it was emotional, and everybody crying and upset, of course, and, and that the whole night was spent like that. People were just, they're, they're just praying and that everything would be all right, but. Down deep, I guess they knew that it wasn't going to be. Monday morning, February 16th, 1959. St. John's, Newfoundland remains at a standstill. 70,000 Newfoundlanders are without power or telephone. City streets and highways are blocked by snowdrifts four and a half meters high. Several homes have been blown from their foundations. Others have had their roofs torn off and windows broken. In the battery, rescue operations have resumed with the light of day. 11 family members are finally set free from the snow-covered home of fisherman Cyril Garland. We couldn't get out. We had to stay there all night. And the next day, they come and shovel us out. The storm begins to abate by mid-morning, but there is little hope that anyone else will be found alive. But there is someone who passed 11 hours trapped in the tomb of a ruined home. I woke up, and when I woke up, I heard um, footsteps way above me, up high, and um, I started screaming again for help. I don't know, I screamed, I, I think, for hours. Finally, somebody heard me, and then I, I heard, could hear voices, you know? They dealt with shovels, then they dealt with their bare hands, because they would, were afraid, I guess, they would injure me, you know? It takes a half an hour, but in the end, Shirley Noseworthy is finally free. It is a miraculous rescue, but it will be the last for the residents of the Battery. Later that day, the body of Judith Vincent is found buried beneath a mattress three meters under the snow. It's a real miracle that uh, any of us survived, especially Gloria, because she was in the same bed with my grandmother. And uh, she survived it, and um, my grandmother didn't. Not far from the body of Mrs. Vincent, friends and neighbors find James and Ethel Piercy still together in their bed. The autopsy said they died from suffocation from the snow and whole uh, top story came off of the house, the roof and, and the sides and everything, and it just went down on top of them. When they found mom and dad, they, uh, dad had his uh, mamas in his arms. At one o'clock the next day, my aunt told me about my parents and my grandmother. I'll never, ever get over it. 
was hurt. Not long afterward, the last body is recovered. It is 19-year-old Ted Wells, Clarence Wells' only son. Life in the battery after the tragedy goes on, but for many, it is never the same. I think the battery was never the same afterwards. It changed everyone's uh, outlook on everything here, the, the fishery, everything. Following the 1959 tragedy, there are several more avalanches on Signal Hill, fortunately without loss of life. In 1998, fences are finally installed to help prevent future rock falls and snow slides. After the tragedy, three of us went to live with our relatives, of course, and everything went on from there. Our lives were changed. We went down different paths, of course, but uh, Charlie, uh, Glory, and I, we kept pretty close. We never really uh, talked about the avalanche a lot because I think it was painful. But uh, you, you survive, you get through it. You have to, life goes on. Are you prepared for a real natural disaster? Or just want to go on a camping trip and want some of the coolest new gadgets? We've got a whole range of products we've personally selected that you can find links to in the descriptions. Just by shopping through those links, you'll help support Bad Day HQ and help us create more great content for you guys.